Welcome back. So this is slightly confusing to announce. As you can see, we have Kelly Misata and Diana Kelly. So I hope you can keep the two of them apart. I'm personally very excited to hear about the topic. Um, I mean, we're here to share knowledge, so let's see how we do that in the most efficient way, right? Let's welcome them. OK, can everybody hear me? Good, good, good. I'm setting a timer, um, partly because this is going to be uh, an interactive session, so um, get ready to engage with us. Welcome. Um, my name is Dr. Kelly Masada. This is Diana Kelly. This is the proper way to spell Kelly, for those of you who didn't know with the extra E, so please take note. Diana Kelly's are wrong. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to move this out of the way as well. So uh, just a little bit about uh, each of us to get started so that you sort of have a frame of where we came from. Um, I have an MBA in marketing. Yes, I used to be one of those marketing people. Um, 15 years, and I'm totally dating myself, 15 years after finishing MBA, I got a PhD in information security. So now I sit in both camps. Um, I was former director of the Tor project for two years. Um, I'm currently the executive director of OISF in Sericata. How many of you know Sericata? Thank you so much. I have stickers. <laughs> so see me afterwards. I'm happy to give you stickers. Um, I'm also setting up a new nonprofit called Sightline that's going to be mission to help other nonprofits improve information security. And I'm a survivor of cyber stalking which is how I got into the space of information security. This was not where I started my career or where I ever thought my career would end up. But through that situation, launched me uh, in this space and actually led me to PhD. So that's a little bit about me. OK, so I actually, I've, I've loved IT security now for pretty, uh, pretty much my whole life. I actually have to, who knows what the dark net is? So for anybody that doesn't know, the DARPA net was built in the 70s by the US government as an alternate communication channel. They thought, oh my gosh, if POTS goes down, if single telephone lines go down, how are we going to talk to each other if there's a right, cold war and everything? How are we going to talk to each other if there's a nuclear uh, event going on? So we're going to build a bunch of networks, a bunch of computers, put them all together. It'll just be us and the government and maybe some of our trusted university partners like MIT. And that's how we're going to communicate with each other. So back in the late 70s, there were about uh, 20, 30 different systems on the DARPANET, and I uh, wanted to know how to manage them because I was completely obsessed, and I couldn't because I didn't have enough access. So I figured out there was a loophole in the login system, and I could shadow the login system and find other people's logins and, and passwords, and I stole an admiral password, and I logged into a military system, but I could read everything I wanted to. <laughs> I only read the management control. Anyway, the US government knows about this. Um, so that's a, it's OK. I have been told outright <laughs> statute of limitations. Um, but, and I had actually, my intent was not at all bad. Plus, honestly, back then, this was not something that a 13-year-old know was really that long, because we were just kind of figuring things out. Anyhow, so that's where I got my absolute love for security and uh, network administration. So grew up in this field, wrote a book, Cryptographic Libraries for Developers, with my partner, Ed Moyle. And uh, I'm currently a mentor in the Cybersecurity Factory program. I'm a faculty at IONS. And I, my full-time job is cybersecurity CTO at Microsoft. And the reason that we're here is that we are kind of tired of the FUD and people scaring. And all this, yeah, every time it seems like you, know, you read a new headline, it's like, oh my god, the sky is falling. How many people have ever tried to describe a cybersecurity event or you know, a breach to a relative that isn't in the, the business with you? Right. The mic is still muted. Oh. And you get a lot, oh, see, I was just so loud, right? <laughs> loud, I know I'm loud. It works in here, just not for <laughs> um, so, uh, so it's So it's not easy. Right? They immediately get very confused. So we really wanted to be, especially with you know, Kelly's background being technical and in cyber now and having a marketing background, we really wanted to come here and talk with you about how we can help 
engage and raise security awareness without basically falling down into this, you know, FUD hole that a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of the media, unfortunately, and a lot of vendors fall into. So we're really looking to change the frame of how you communicate and the language that we use every single day that's very automatic. It's like muscle memory of the words that we use. So we're going to go through some examples. And then at the end, we're going to ask for a couple of volunteers. Um, and again, I have stickers. You have stickers? Yes? No, I did okay, I not. I, only bring, have I, I could send you Ninja <laughs> Kitty. You know who Ninja Kitty is? I can send you Ninja Kitty, but I don't have Ninja Kitty. But with we're me. bribing volunteers with stickers, so so get ready for that. But really, our goals are not to dumb it down. So I think often in our space, people think that in order to be able to explain what we do, we have to make it dumb. That's not our intention. We can actually communicate better without making either you feel like you're dumbing it down or the people who you're talking to feel stupid. The other thing is to change the words that we use. Okay, and it's really, sometimes it's just being mindful. Um, did anybody know that the word uh, network traffic, most people don't even understand what that means? So we're gonna give you some hints on how to change that. But the, the main goal is to make our work more accessible, right? It's great that everyone in this room understands these concepts, gets these concepts, does great, does great work, but when you put it out in the wild and you've got all these people who are using your products, trying to engage with you, and they don't get it, it's going to make the whole system fail, right? We're all connected. So we're going to try and um, help and, make your world more accessible. And also, who here is a, a researcher? We got a couple of researchers. OK, who here has ever wanted to publish your research or publish something in the security space? Yeah, and, and it can be, if, are anybody here at a Fortune like 1000 kind of company trying to do that? Yeah, it, it, it's really easy, right? You just, you get, you write down the research and then you publish it and you can talk to the press and the media. It's not like this. So I actually built and managed the research publication process at IBM Security. You know what IBM has a lot of? Lawyers. <laughs> and PR, and this is not necessarily a bad thing. IBM's a big international company. What IBM said really, really mattered. But when we found a vulnerability, we were always having to balance between what the company said, how that message was interpreted by the rest of the world, and most importantly, walking that fine line between explaining something to raise awareness so that we can, as Trooper says, make the world a safer place, and scaring people and creating a cookbook. How do you say, I found a vulnerability and walk people through that vulnerability so that they know you're not just, just like, you know, I can hack the world, you know, because right? Right? anybody can say that. Oh, I can, I can break windows in two seconds. Well, how? Well, when you get into the how, it's arguably a cookbook for the attackers. So balancing all of that out. So that's really, um, and it would say getting your message out, that's a big part of what we're talking about as far as, as the message and getting that communication going. So I'm not going to talk about this guy who we all know, but what I want to do is tell you a story about when my head exploded. Okay. Now, first of all, when I was being attacked by my cyber stalker, and by the way, he did it over the course of seven years where he was most active. During that space, that time period, I actually had to learn this space all on my own. I had no idea what an IP was. I had no idea what networks were. I had no idea how to expand headers, never mind encryption, never mind PGP, all those things, right? This all became very new to me. So during the course of my journey, I actually was unemployed for a couple of years. And, and my attacker used Tor, by the way. Um, before I started working for them, which is another story I'm happy to tell you. But let me fast track to this. So I'm working at Tor. I'm director of communications. It's June 2013. And all of a sudden, my phone starts blowing up. And what happened was this picture hit the wire. OK, and as director of communications, you can imagine that my job was to talk to the world about Tor, to explain it, 
to provide understanding around anonymity, privacy, to explain that not uh, more than just bad people on the internet use store, right? To really explain the whole ecosystem. And that was hugely challenging because we weren't ready for this. This was like, holy crap, four weeks of my life spent talking to BBC, CNN, Al Jazeera, everybody that you can possibly imagine because of this one photograph, which in fact, that's not even his laptop. That's Laura's right. laptop, okay? And people asking the simple question of how did he get the sticker? <laughs> right? The stickers are everywhere. So what was interesting was that I actually had to step into that space in a very critical moment under a lot of stress, under a lot of optics to say, how am I going to explain to the world what Tor means? And by the way, any of the journalists who did any research on me came back to me and said, how can you, as a victim who is, uh, whose attacker used Tor against you, defend this technology? So there were lots of messages I had to actually pull out of my head to be able to say, uh, and this was before PhD, so I'm like, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm still figuring this out. So it was really that moment where my head was exploring, going, holy crap, I don't believe in, I don't belong in the security space at all. Please get me out. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, you know, security people get, you know, the, people really ramp up very, very quickly. And it's in part because most people don't understand how the technology works. And if you don't know something, you can get very scared by it. So now we're in this bizarre space where we've got you know, elections being thrown and influenced, and we've got you know, nation state attacks against each other and weaponizing vulnerabilities and commercial software that the government won't share, even with the vendor, that there's this big vulnerability because they like the back door. Uh, you know, this is a, it's, it, it's, in general, most people are really, really scared by this right now, and it's our job to at least help to, to explain it to them. And by R, I mean everybody who's here at Troopers. This is how we're going to help make the world safer. So during this time, and ever since actually, because I still feel like I have a new brain in this space, whenever I come against something I don't know, I go and look at the definition, right? And we are in a world of hackers. We hear this world around this word around all the time. And Troopers is a family of hackers, maybe? Would you categorize some of you as hackers? Yeah, so we, what I wanted to do is like step back and say, what is the definition, really? Because frankly, I've been, even early in my career, in my security career, I've been one of those people that stands on stage and says, Their hackers are not all bad. People who use Tor are not all bad. People in security are not all scary, OK? But you have to balance that with what the definition really means. And then I start to think about who are the people in the world that are, were traditional hackers, like Steve Wozniak. And I love using him as a reference for this word because he doesn't call himself a hacker. He calls himself a tinkerer, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, do you remember one of, one of the first hacks ever was? I think it was in the 60s at MIT. They uh, challenged themselves to be able to take a car apart, put it into building 10 at MIT, and then reassemble it at the top of the building. So that's like, that was an original hack, was you know, this pure engineering, how do you take things apart and, and put it back together, not what it is now, which is criminal, um, is really what I think it's synonymous for criminal right. with a, a lot of times when people hear that word. So if you, if you were introduced as a hacker, or actually, if you were introduced as a tinkerer, and not a hacker, do you think the response back would be different? Or if you were introduced as a gadgeteer, like Steve Wozniak, would the response be different? Because right now, I mean, I, I have a vivid memory. I was, when I was at Tor, I was in Washington, D.C., and I was listening to this gentleman from the International Center for Missing and Exploited Children who banged his, his um, hand on the podium and said, if Tor didn't exist, there'd be no child pornographers on the internet. <laughs> right? So, and then he said, all Tor people wear black, sit in their basement, and code, and that's all they do. 
So after the talk, now I'm, I'm in Washington, D.C., so I'm wearing my nice blue suit, my pretty shoes, my hair done. Went down at the end, and I said to him, I said, hello, Mr. Allen, my name is Kelly Masada. I'm from the Tour Project. And his face went, I said, do I look like a hacker to you? He's like, no. I said, so maybe you shouldn't lump everyone into the same bucket, because you could be wrong. So what we're going to do is walk you through a few examples. Okay, These are all real headlines. They're from various sources around um, the media. But what I want to do is sort of break down what people are seeing in the world when they see the headlines related to security. So for this one, um, I'll just walk you through it really quickly. So when I read this from both the marketing and the security side, I sort of take it word by word. First thing is I see is teenager, because all teenagers are scary, all teenagers are bad, right? They make bad choices. They're okay? the ones hacking in their mom's basement, Exactly. Right? This is a real headline, too. This is from Computer Weekly. Suspected of crippling Dutch banks. So first thing is, as a US citizen, I'm like, oh, that's all across the ocean. Doesn't matter. It's not happening in my backyard, right? Never thinking about how banks are connected in many ways. And by the way, banks mean money. So now you're attacking money. So that's very much thought provoking for the reader. And then with DDoS attacks with two capital D's and one capital S. If you ask the person in your life that is the least technical, like a parent, grandparent, spouse, friend, if they knew what a DDoS attack, how many of them would know? Right? Most people don't even understand why the O is little. Now, now challenge yourself. OK, we're going to set one challenge. Kelly said that there will be stickers at the end. Right? Think in the back of your mind, just run a little cron job while we're doing, going through and talking about how to explain things without FUD. Uh, one of you, uh, we'd like a volunteer at the end of this to come up here and explain DDoS to your least technical relative. Yes. And actually, my daughter is in the audience, and she's an engineer. Uh, at Purdue, and she's 19, um, so you can explain it to her. There you go. Sorry, sweetheart. You, you, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot. This is what you get for coming to my talk. <laughs> she's your mean mom. <laughs> I know, I know. She's here supporting you. I know. <laughs> I love her. Um, here's another one, and, and my dear friend is from Microsoft. But So when, when you read this, you're like, Microsoft patches 15 critical bugs, right? This word patch was used, I, I lost count, like yesterday I counted over 30 occurrences of the word patch, right? In our space, in our community, it's, a, it's part of the language, right? But for average users, what do they think of? Patches on jackets, right? Not necessary. Putting a patch on your jacket isn't necessary. But we're requiring people in order to be more secure to do patches. So the word that we're using isn't engaging them in action. In fact, most of them go, eh, I'll get to it later, if at all. Right? So how do we change those words? Yeah. This one's yours. OK. So The Guardian. Anybody here read The Guardian? It's a UK great, great newspaper. Uh, but it's, it's definitely for the, the public, right? It's for the masses. It's not for a technical audience. And here's an actual headline again. Encryption keeps us safe. Well, first of all, encryption, which how many non-technical people really know what encryption is? And it kind of it starts to make people feel a little uncomfortable. So encryption, it keeps us safe. It, it, does it? I mean, is it encryption that's keeping us safe? <laughs> you know, so encryption keeps us safe. All right, I guess I'm going to read that, and I'm going to feel like, uh, but then it must not be compromised with back doors. How many people reading The Guardian do you think really understand what the term back door is? And now, they, now what, what's the reader probably feeling? A, little overwhelmed because they don't understand this headline, but B, now kind of scared. Because there was something that was keeping us safe, apparently. 
but somebody's going to hurt it with this thing called a back door, which I don't know. I have a back door at the house, but I guess it's kind of weird or not okay in the software world. So, you know, these are terms that, you know, as reading them, are not going to help the reader to actually um, understand what this is about. It's not going to help them move forward with how do I feel about back doors or help explain it to them. What it does is it gets a, a reaction and probably a click. And this is something that we have to face all the time in the media world, is that they're trying to get the clicks. And if we can, again, help to educate and you know, make sure that they're not getting all of the, you know, that, that we're explaining to them in ways that will help them be able to write it in an engaging manner without resorting to jargon that's just going to fear and clickbait. Especially for anybody who is working on research publication or talking to the media, this is really, really, really important. Yeah, when I was working on PhD, and again, I started my PhD at the ripe old age of 44. Um, and so your brain is not accustomed to learning in that academic space again. And I was in my advanced cryptography class, literally getting physically ill watching the Diffie-Hellman exchange being explained to me, right? That I was like, marketing people should not learn this. Marketing I mean, this was the mantra in my head, but I was like, oh my god. And then I actually was at a conference where Martin Hellman was a speaker before me. He comes off the stage. I punched him in the arm. He's like, what's that for, Kelly? I said, I hate your stuff. It makes me cry. Uh. So, But the important thing was to be able to sort of step into and say, how can I take this very complicated thing right and translate it into a space and into a language that I could actually like absorb inside myself to be able to speak to it to others so that's where I had to actually shift how to approach all of this and think about you know the teachers you had in school or speakers that you've heard when you've gone to see their talks when you learned something new and not just, hey, you know how to write you know, Python, or you know how to write Java, and someone's going to sh show you some code that's malware written there, and you go, oh, I see that, how that's working. But just something absolutely new that you did not have a grasp on at all before. You know, what did that teacher do? What engaged you? Think about what, very often, it's that they somehow made it a completely accessible. And it, again, it doesn't have to be dumbed down, but it has to be accessible and to sort of light up the fire and engage you inside. I had a philosophy professor who said, I don't care if you can get the exact dates when this, you know, when Kierkegaard was born, when Nietzsche was born, I don't care. You don't need to know the date, you don't need to know the exact year. If you can get within like a 50 year era, you know when he or she lived and wrote in general, and that's okay. And that was very eye opening for me because it was more about the spirit of engaging and learning than it was about memorizing something very rote. And that, for most of us, we learn visually and we learn by having you know, our, our souls engaged. And, and let me tell you, working with non-technical people takes a lot of patience. And there are people both in my Tor world and my current Suricata world that I would never have speak to regular humans. They don't have the patience for it. So some of this isn't easy. It may just seem like, oh, that's super easy. I'll just change it. It actually takes some practice and some work. So we're going to walk you through, and I'm going to, and Diane is going to do this first one. Um, through a couple of exercises. Yep. So now, so we, we picked apart two different headlines for you and ID'd where some of the, the pitfalls were. So here again, this is a real headline. Uh, this is from the Daily Beast. Are we, are we fudding here? Are we doing some, some intense FUD? And, and where? What, what do you see that's going to start triggering the average reader when we see this kind of a headline? Anybody want to? Come on, we have stickers. We have Suricata stickers. They got meerkats on them. And Suricon stickers. Now that I'm plugging another conference, but it's in Vancouver in November. <laughs> what do you read? Yeah, what do you, what do you see here? I mean, where, where's the FUD? It's not, it's not too deep. Yeah. <laughs> Everywhere? Deep web. Deep web? Yeah. Definitely. I, we were saying earlier, it's like it's surprising they didn't use dark web. It's like they would have just like made it almost would have gotten like a hundred percent of of FUD. Anything else? Yes? Huh? Kidnapped. kidnapped. Yeah. Yeah. We've got we've got a, a, a young person who's kidnapped. How about something that's really clickbaity on here? It's not necessarily FUD, but it's yeah. 
Bingo. Yes. A 20-something-year-old model, right? Yeah. So now you have that vision in your head of who this person is. Go ahead. Yes. Right. <laughs> right. It's, it's, we, we've got this horrible, terrible thing that went, hop, went on because of something on this horrible, dark, deep web, right? But then <laughs> could, could, who's next? <laughs> right. It's and awful. it's an auction, right? So when the average users think of an auction, granted, a lot of people might think of eBay. But what they might think of is this model standing up on a stage and all these black hoodies saying, I'll take her. Right? Exactly. Yes, absolutely. Anybody read the site Threat Post? Okay. So, um, Threat Post, they made a very conscious decision. And I actually asked them when I saw this shift in their editorial tone. It was a very conscious decision that rather than saying such and such is vulnerable, such and such software is vulnerable, they would say a patch was released or a fix was released, an update was released. Uh, to this particular software. And then you had to read the actual article to see why that had been released. And it was because they really did want to turn this around. Because very often what we do is we see this very clickbaity, ah, you know, the software is vulnerable. Well, it was before the patch was released. And if you didn't patch, then, then it's still vulnerable. But it's, again, it's this way to just you know, raise the fear. And so they did make this editorial decision uh, to try and just say, you know, to your point, turn a positive into a positive, i.e., yeah, this software is broken and it's been fixed versus <gasps> broken software, everyone's going to die. So our next example is about inspiring action, okay? Because not every headline that has to do with security is doom and gloom, but it does still go back to that point of we're kind of scaring people and we're confusing the heck out of most people, right? So Facebook's machine learning algorithms accurately predicts suicide. What are you reading here, or what do you see? Are we... A machine is learning? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. How does that work? Oh, that must be some coder sort of sitting in a basement somewhere making that work. Or a robot. Right? Robotics. What else? Right. And are we going to move into the science fiction realm of the world's going to be taken over by robots? Mm -hmm. Right? The machines are going to start learning everything about us, all the way down to our deep, dark, painful secrets that's going to be able to predict it before we even act on it. This is like, I mean, I grew up with the Jetsons, which I thought was a cool show. Um, but this is like sci-fi at its best. Yeah. But what, what's the word in there that like is really the one that people go, ooh, security. Accurately is one, but also algorithms. Algorithms to you guys is like average language, right? You say an algorithm to a non-technical person, what do they think? Some weird deep math thing that I don't understand. I don't want to understand it. Please don't make me look at it. Go walk over there because now you're getting too technical, too geeky. Don't talk to me. Right? They completely shut down. But I mean, in this example, one of the things that Facebook could do is that we're actually looking at ways to be able to look at the data, to be able to help people who seem to be in a dark place come out of it. Right? There's lots of ways to bring this out, but they're using these words and it's creating confusion. So is the, is the subtitle your take on that? Because the subtitle reads like a positive description of that. This is exactly a screenshot from this article. So the subtitle, you're absolutely right, gives a great <coughs> explanation of it. Look at how small the type is. Yeah. I don't know about any of you, but I now wear readers. I can't read stuff that small anymore on my, on my phone, never, never mind on my laptop. So we have another example. Again, creating states of confusion. 
Yeah, so, so this one here, uh, what are we seeing? Again, popular mechanics. Kind Pop, of, popular and, mechanics and, of all an magazines. An odd place, <laughs> but thoughts on, on this headline. And again, if we want to ultimately you know, work on clarity versus confusion and inspire positive action, is this headline going to help us inspire positive action? What? No. No. Now, how many how many people here are, are have done penetration tests or you know right? So when you see definitely hacked, right? You're a pen tester. You're thinking everything, right? I mean, you know, it's like we know that software and systems are vulnerable. But how about this in popular mechanics? And is this going to help us as an industry inspire action? You had your, your hand up. What, what do you think is, is going to maybe disinspire action here? I was actually wondering whether not someone would get scared enough to actually do something. Is that you're hoping that, yeah. Uh, so there's actually a lot of good research. Um, and this is one of the things we wanted to bring up. So there's a lot of really good research that human beings learn. Remember, we're, we're animals. Right? We still got the lizard brain. And we learn when we've got a little bit of adrenaline going in us, because it actually helps to imprint the memory of what we're learning. We don't learn well when we're in full fight or flight mode. So too much adrenaline actually means that we're not learning and retaining the information well. And most importantly, we're extremely distracted by all of this fear that's running through us. And what do most people who are under a huge state of stress and fear, what kind of decision-making process are they, do they have at that point? Is it good? Think about the times you've been really stressed out. You know, I was actually just running through Heathrow yesterday, you know, and that was after I had run through the New York, New York City to get on the subway to get to Heathrow. Right? Um, you know, and it was like I was basically not thinking very well. Think about those times when you've been under complete stress. Are you making really thoughtful, logical, strategic decisions, or are you just kind of like in act mode? Right? So that's it. how do we balance? But to your point, a little bit of adrenaline, it helps us. Because what can't we do as an industry? You know, you're, you're a pen tester, so you know. I mean, I've, I've, I've done this in the past. Everything is pretty much breakable with enough time and resources. And what we are not doing well as an industry at all is a really robust secure development life cycle where we test our code, we unit test it, we integration test it, we test it in production. We're not doing an awesome job at some of this. And the impacts used to be some kid's going to get on the DARPA net, um, or our bank accounts could be drained. The banks will make us whole. They always do. Um, right now, what's going to happen if the software goes, goes awry or if there, somebody can attack the, the software? Loss of life. We've got a lot of loss of life. So we can't underplay it. We can't say, everything's fine. We got this under control. Look the other way. But if we scare people too much, we're going to turn them off. Anybody ever seen, you know, have you had a cancer screening a billboard when you're going through an airport or outside? Right? When you see, have you had your cancer screening, is your response, thanks for that reminder. I have not had my cancer screening this year going to call the doctor right now. What's your general, the general response is, is usually like, oh my god, cancer. I don't want to get cancer. Right? We all kind I'd of I'd rather that. not know. Rather <laughs> not know. So that's really, so that, that, that's it. And thinking about it, you know, now seeing these, right, you can start to see how the, the, the community of, you know, publications really do pull us into click and unfortunately very often over um, you know, over scarce, especially people that are not in the industry. Well, and I love this one because the here's why they do it makes it sound like there's an expert sitting at Popular Mechanic who knows all the inner workings oh, of yeah. this issue, right? Yeah. So people are looking for experts to guide them. They're looking for that playbook or the easy button to say, I'm just going to press that and I'm good. You know, and we were actually at an FBI conference last week in the Boston area, and Kevin, we were talking about one of the mm -hmm. keynotes, Kevin Mandia. You know, Mandiant and Kevin Mandia. So, right, if anybody knows why they do it, I think Kevin Mandia is one of the people in the world that would have a really good set of insights. And he was talking about different APTs that Mandiant had, had looked at. Um, and he didn't pur purport to know everything. No. You know? I mean, so like popular mechanics, yeah, I do kind of question if they. 
So, so the big so what is, right? And this is where PhD got beaten into my head because my advisors kept saying, I don't care what you think, just tell me the so what. So the so what is who feeds the media, right? These are all headlines out of the media. So you have to think about down the food chain of who's feeding the media. When I was at Tor, I took that role very, very seriously. And trust me, there's a lot of journalists out there that are not nice people um, and not intelligent and don't care that they're not intelligent. Um, but there are some really good ones. And so whenever I found that sort of that shining example, I really tried to work with them. I did more trainings about Tor with journalists than any other group over the two years that I was there. Guess how I explained Tor? I never talked about computers. To explain Tor, I brought envelopes, paper envelopes, and pieces of paper. And I had people in the audience act as the nodes. And that's how I described how Tor work. Because they would come up to me and they say, oh my god, thank you very much. Now I see it. Now I understand how this works. Now I understand why it's slow. Now I see how law enforcement sits on the beginning or sits at the end, right? Now I understand how it encrypts the traffic but not the content of what's being sent, right? So I could explain all that without ever talking about technology at all. And it was really, really helpful. So for, for me at that time, I was like training journalists in that very, and that, that took 45 minutes to do that example. So I couldn't talk about anything else during that time. So thinking about who feeds the media and engaging with them. Also, who feeds the decision makers in your organizations? If you have a breach or something goes sideways, who's going to make the decisions? And do they understand what they're going to be deciding on? Right? So you guys have a lot of responsibility to like communicate up that food chain. Um, but how do we make our work more accessible? I mean, I think about my daughters, I think about my mom, I think about the people closest to me. I mean, how many of you uh, provide IT support to your family? Right? I think about th those are the people because those are the people that I'm engaging with. So I can do everything I can to keep myself secure, but if I'm engaging with my mom, hmm, she won't ever watch this so I can talk about her. Um, if I'm engaging with my mom, she's, she has no idea about any of this stuff. She's like, I, can you go get a real job? <laughs> now that you have PhD, can you go get a real job is what she's telling me. But I want to figure out to help, help her and help others like her kind of step into this space in a very simple way. One of the biggest ahas that I see in people is when I teach them how to find the frequent locations on their iPhones. Simple, you guys all know where that is, right? It's like four layers deep into the settings. People have no idea how this thing works, have no idea how the technology is tracking them or not tracking them. And what I've always tried to encourage people to realize is that I'm not telling you what to do or what not to do. What I'm trying to do is educate you so you can make a better choice for yourself. It's not my place to tell you what to do. It is my place to give you more data, more knowledge, more inspiration to be able to make better choices. And, and recommended actions are really, so Kelly's talking about showing people where you know, the locations are, but also giving people something they can do. In our industry, unfortunately, even when we do everything we can not to hype up the FUD and not to create the crazy spike in adrenaline, unfortunately the reality is it's kind of a scary space. And so we can talk to them very calmly about it, help them to understand, speak in their language. You're going to talk to your, your relative that's not technical, a little bit different than if you're talking to the media, if you're publishing research, right? You need to know your audience, talk in their language. But giving them something to do is the most powerful thing you can do, other than trying to tamp down the hysteria and be clear, give them good examples. Give them an action. 
What can I do? Can I stop that from, from uh, you know, coming after me? When we do research, we say, hey, here's this really big, this is an attack, this is a vulnerability. It's either we've already talked to the company and they have created a patch, so what's your action? You can update your software. Or is there something else, especially after you know, WannaCry and not Petya, there was so much, what can we do, what can we do? Well, there are some steps you can take in addition to, obviously, the patching. You can segment your network. You can have a backup that's not available offline, so if it's a, a, a worm for the ransomware for the encryption, it's not going to get there, right? And I'm using the tech jargon now because we're technical. Um, but it's those actions. It's giving people hope. The worst thing for human beings is when we have hopelessness. And right now, we're in a state where we're kind of, anybody know about the dogs and the, the learned hopelessness? So this is kind of any, I'm sorry, I'm a, a huge dog lover, but this, this is really heartbreaking, but we are very, you know, we're what, 99% DNA of dogs, you know, this happens to humans too. So they, they put dogs into a room and they uh, started to electrify parts of the, the floor. And the dogs learned which parts of the floor, because they got shock, they learned which parts of the floor were safe. And then they moved to those parts of the floor. Well, then they decided to do something else and they electrified the entire floor. And the dogs just basically gave up. You know, they knew then they, they had a, one space that they that wasn't electrified, but the dogs didn't care. The dogs just gave up and stopped trying to find a way to stop being shocked and stop being hurt. And that's called this phenomena of learned hopelessness and helplessness, sorry. Um, if we get into this helpless and hopeless space as, as a community, <laughs> we're gonna be in trouble because we want, our end users are ultimately going to be part of the biggest you know, way. We always say, oh, you know, DFO, dumb effing operator, right? It's, it's the, 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 their fault. The reason the code's bad, stupid developer. No, we all have to, this is all our responsibility. <laughs> so it's really important that we engage people and a great way to get over that helplessness is if we give them actions. So. Speak carefully, but also always when you're saying something, hey, this is a problem, here's something we can do and we can take action you can do to help to prevent attacks or help prevent an next breach. And I love this word. So sheeple, I first heard it from Diana. Um, honestly, I don't know if this is a, a Diana Kelly word, but it Wake should up, be. Wake up, sheeple. No, um, it's, it's not. It's not. It's but really, it's about, again, getting people out of this, this zone right, of just following because they don't know anything else to do. So we're going to give you some ideas on what to do, and then we're going to test it for stickers, all right? So the things to consider and the things to walk away with is pitch the why it matters, okay? So at Tor, whenever I was working with other colleagues, um, the folks who got to talk to other humans, um, I would always ask them, please do not tell a scary story. Do not talk about somebody getting killed. Do not talk about child molestation. Do not talk about human trafficking. Talk about something positive, something some average person could actually wrap their heads around. So figure out why it's important. Then talk about vulnerabilities. You know, where are the weak spots in the system? Um, and the focusing on the opportunities to make things better. So in the work that I'm building around sightline security, it's not about making nonprofit security experts. What it is is about helping them identify what they have and just making one step forward in the right direction. Not 10, not 15, they're not gonna be perfect. One step, if one person makes one step in the right direction, it's better for everybody, right? It's better than just standing still. Engage with communications experts, okay? There are people who go to school who get advanced degrees in communications, crisis communications, how to talk to other human beings. It's really important to be able to understand how that works. Um, most adults are visual learners, okay? I know I'm a visual learner. I can, I swear to God, I can still see the blackboard with Professor Wagstaff doing advanced cryptography, showing us the whole thing. I can see it in my head like it was yesterday. So most adults are visual learners. I still draw on napkins to help explain things to people because then they'll remember it. But also give people a chance to own their own knowledge. So again, it's not about making an expert 
out of everyone you meet. And it's not about bringing everybody into your space. It's about just giving them that little nugget of information. And so I want to give you an example, a quick one. So my dissertation research was, as you can imagine, on the information security preparedness of nonprofits, specifically domestic violence and human trafficking organizations. Sent out a survey to about 500 organizations, got 250 back. Um, so the response was really great. But I want to show you this example because it was really like that kick in the head for me. Ooh. So I get uh, an email from one of the respondents. Now this person actually runs an organization over a million dollars worth of revenue. I really want to take the survey, but the link isn't working. I'm like, oh my god, it's broken. The whole, my whole dissertation is going down the toilet was where I was sitting in this moment. So I said, oh, so glad you're interested. Thank you so much. I reset the link, sent it back out to her. All was great. That was her response. Right? You would think in 2018, somebody wouldn't give this response. All she, she just didn't hit the consent button on the survey so she could get into the survey. Oh, OK, we're going to move on. But anyway, so the important thing is, is that people like this are, are walking amongst us, right? And they're not, they're not bad people, right? We want to help them be more secure, but like if I brought that in front of any of my developers, they'd be like, I don't want to talk to them, <laughs> right? They're idiots. I look at that and I'm like, ooh, what could we do? How could we help them? What information is valuable to them to help them make a difference? And keep in mind that you've got a lot of noise that you're competing with. There's uh, noise from people that are spreading misinformation on the news shows. Um, there's noise of just, we all have a lot of things that we think about during the day that gets in our way. Uh, you know, Kelly asked me to take a picture of my dog listening to me. That's Nora. Um, and uh, she, Nora could not concentrate on me or posing for the photo because she had something irritated. That's Katya in the background irritating her in the background. So remember that you know, as you're talking to your audience, they've probably got their own version of Katya. They want to listen to you, but they may get distracted. So you have to be really focused on making sure it's a very clear message. And you may need to repeat it a couple times because they could be a little distracted. All right, so should we start with the interactive part? Who would like to be our verse victim? No, volunteer. Yeah, who wants to volunteer? Who wants to come up and explain DDoS to your non-technical uh, relative. Okay. Come, awesome. Do you want to do it from your seat? You're welcome to, or you can come or up. Come up. Do okay. Okay. Yay! Yay! Get up. All right. So to get so to give you someone to focus on, there's my daughter Amanda. Raise your hand. There's my daughter. I promise I will buy you a nice dinner later. Um, <laughs> explain DDoS to my daughter. So, you you have a shop, a small shop where you do buy some things. In the shop, the most, the number of person that can go inside the shop is 10, let's say. So one day you go buy a product, get out the shop, take your money, makes profit, everything is good. But someday a disgruntled buyer said, I don't want that shop to take that money from me. It's too expensive to what they are selling. So what he is doing? He's staying in the front of the shop and say to people that hang around the shop, go in, stay there, do not buy anything. One, two, three, ten. So you have ten people in the shop, and a good, a good buyer wants to enter, but he cannot enter because there are already ten people in the shop. The attack is working, or if you have a great attack, you can put somebody in the queue. So you have to stay in the queue after ten or 15 people that are waiting, trying not to buy anything because the disgruntled buyer told them to do. This is the right. Does that make sense? Yeah? yeah? So All right. You have a visual in your head. So that is a great example of a visual in somebody's head of like real life things that they could be like, OK, I can see the store. I can see the people. I can see how there's too many people in. 
But what does DDoS mean? Like, what's the technical term? Distributed? Exactly. Wanted to buy it, you cannot buy it. Exactly. Imagine in an online banking, the bank could not offer services to people. People cannot use the services. Exactly. And what, what you can do is you can actually take the acronym, you know, expand it to the real world word, and then parse it out and explain it through that analogy. That's that's like the hook because just like we did with the yeah. with the um, headlines. We took it down piece by piece. That's where you get it because the analogy was awesome. Um, the acronym is flipping confusing. The big words in the middle are also confusing, but if you weave it all together, it'll make sense for folks. And also, the, the difference between DDoS and DOS is the fact that uh, if you have DOS, you just stay in the front of the door and the owner will kill, uh, call the police and the attack is over. But when you have DDoS, People are still going in the shop. The police cannot do anything to them because they enter out, in and out, yeah. in and out. That's a go. great. So now all of you have that example yeah. in your heads, right? Yeah. So if you need to explain a DDoS attack to somebody in your miss, use this example. It's awesome. Or an executive. Thank I, you. I will give you stickers after. An executive. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, do you have one, time more. For one more. more. What do you want to have? Encryption? Yeah. Okay. Who can, who wants to explain? You know, the whole encryption keeps us safe. Who wants to explain that to either your CEO? <laughs> um, why does encryption keep us safe or, or not keep us safe? Your CEO or your non-technical relative? Uh, without using the words math, algorithm, <laughs> we're gonna have a buzzer yes. <laughs> like American Idol going. Eh. Anyone? Come on. What? You guys have must have had to explain uh, encryption to somebody. Guys, there's, there's someone has oh. a crypto project going on. Wait, you moment. already said it. <laughs> it's not scary. This is good learning. No. Okay, pick an, how about explain. Um, anybody want to explain any technical topic to? <coughs> anything that you, okay, how about anybody here have a technical topic that you've had to explain that you really hit on a great description for it? So you want to share that. Where you say, hey, this is how I really engaged and got people to understand. How would this you, is what it means. How would you describe intrusion detection? How would you explain Suricata? <laughs> yeah, we got some Suricata users here. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit hard, okay. right? You, all right, Kelly, I, I you, you go. How do you explain actually. Suricata to yeah, non-technical? Oh, we got some. Ah, OK, perfect. <coughs> All right, yay. <laughs> <laughs> so I've taken the Suricata course last year at the Troopers. So oh, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 they didn't use any examples. Um, <laughs> I would just say it's like a trained motion detection system like, um, that, just, that just sets off an alarm when, when something really bad happens and nothing good happens. Like some motion detector you have in your house that will turn on your light but only mm -hmm. if someone uh, wants to steal from you, enters the room. Exactly, like That's that. the, it's yeah. a great way to explain it. Um, and it could be something benign or it could be something alarming. You yeah. don't know, right? But it's gonna raise that alert. Um, so motion detector in a house or even motion detectors to turn the lights on, turn the lights off kind of thing is a great way to explain it. Yeah. So, all right, awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, just three things we want you to walk away with. Listen actively to the folks around you. And really, over the next couple of days, listen to words that people are using that you're like, yeah, somebody's not going to understand what the heck you're talking about. You're going to lose them. Engage with non-technical folks. Please, please, please. Um, I know they can be frustrating. I know it sometimes takes a lot of patience. Um, but again, it's about teaching them one thing, not all things. And then just act well um, in the process. So speaking from somebody who came in this industry very late in her career, um, I really have appreciated the people in my life like Diana and others who have actually stepped in and said, um, I will teach you, I will help you, I will work with you. 
Um, even though I'm not, you know, a lifelong computer scientist, I feel like I have a space in this world thanks to people like Diana. So please pass this forward. Um, we're happy to answer any questions now or after the session. I'm also happy to give more stickers. I'll give you lots of stickers for your participation, John. Yeah. Yeah, you but, hand out the stickers. Yeah, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Questions? I have one. I mean, first of all, really good talk. I like it. Still, I have a somewhat critical question. Um, so basically, all the explanations that we had here, they were like anal analogies to the real world, like explaining like with the store or like uh, motion detection. Mm -hmm. uh, but then again, you also mentioned like backdoor in one of the headlines mm -hmm. was a bad example. However, that's kind of an anal analogy from the like real world. And I even think uh, backdoor and programs got introduced because burglars often come through the backdoor. Right, and, and that's where it gets really tricky because lots of the topics in our space, so I spend a lot of my time actually as a privacy advocate, um, and privacy really has kind of that wiggly space of good, bad, and people don't know what the heck to do with it. So helping people understand that sitting on the fence and understanding both the positive and the not positive side of terms like backdoor is really important because then what they get to do is they actually get to make a decision about where their moral compass or where their thought process puts them. Um, we saw this talk last week with a F director of FBI talking about um, encryption needing a back door. Um, and me as a privacy advocate was like, yeah, no, please. But there were people in the room nodding their heads like, of course, of course. Yeah, and I mean, you know, if you think about it, your house, right, there's the front door and the back door. Everybody knows there's a front door and a back door. It's just the back door isn't there because it's hidden and it's, you know, so that people can't, don't know about it, right? It's there because you probably want to get in from your backyard, um, which is very different than what back doors are in software. So it is a real world example, but it can be confusing. And what we see with back doors very often now are these are unintentional, hidden. They were either written in maliciously or they're asked for by uh, observing entity or government who wants to be able to, they want to snoop, but not let others. But what happens when we build in a back door like that? Generally, it's not going to be hidden. Your back door, the attacker, and very often, where does, if someone's physically breaking into your house, where are they probably going to go to? Uh, the back door. Because <laughs> then it used to be even more, so now we have cameras, but it, that was the number one place that they would go, because it's not visible from the front, from the street. So, you know, with back doors, they really, I, I think even using back door, I, that term is a little bit dicey because it's, 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 people don't know what it is, but also it's really not very good descriptor of what truly is being written in. I'll give you one more quick example. So uh, before I went to work for Tor, I called the Tor project because um, when I was being attacked, the FBI took my case. And they said to me, we cannot go after this guy. We cannot charge him, even though that we knew who he was, because he's using Tor. So I called Tor, and I talked to Andrew Loom, and I said, please, 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 please give me the keys to the kingdom so this terrible experience, this terrible situation will be over. And he did a really wonderful job of actually explaining to me in a moment of crisis, in a moment where I couldn't breathe and I couldn't think clearly, explained to me that if Tor had a back door to it or had a key to it, that's putting not only the Tor project at risk because then they can be, they can be hit from both sides. They can come in from the law enforcement saying, we have a right to this, and we can come in from the bad guys saying, hand this over to us you know, or we're going to hurt somebody kind of situation. So it was really that moment where I stepped in and I'm like, OK, that makes sense to me. And even in a moment of crisis, I could wrap my head around that explanation. You had a question? Um, it was just about the, the word backdoor. Yeah. The, the, the first thought I had when I read backdoor was basically the same that, mm. that you had. But um, I think most of the people, when, when they're talking about software, don't, don't, are not able to make that jump from the word backdoor in real life to software. Yeah. And all these these yeah. um, levels that we discussed about hidden back doors and stuff like that, they can't um, wrap their heads around that, I guess. Yeah. I, so I, you would have to, you can use the word back door, but you would have to explain it in a few sentences to have normal people 
understand what it means in, in terms of software. Yeah. Right. So. Yep. But That's think about agree. the people who are who are creating laws, who are making decisions about our governments, who are making decisions, critical decisions every single day. And technology is a part of those decisions. So that's the education gap. That's the knowledge gap that scares me the most.